say one or two things about the Midlands Mass Spectrometry Group and Midlands Innovation for those of you who are not familiar with it. So I'm sure everyone knows what Midlands Innovation is. It's a collaboration between eight universities to drive innovation across um, the Midlands and it has a very strong clinical theme to it. So the, the, the um, clinical research uh, is, is a major part of the Midlands Innovation Group. And as part of the Midlands, Midlands Innovation, um, the Midlands Mass Spectrometry Group was formed by the main uh, mass spectrometry facilities across the Midlands to bring um, some information to researchers about use of mass spectrometry uh, across a range of different research areas. So we've, we've covered a, a number of different areas, but uh, we're very, very fortunate today um, to be covering the clinical area and to have an external speaker for, for our, our colloquium today. The format today is slightly different um, from the way we've done this before. So uh, we're going to have a talk from Dr. Natalie Homer. And then after that, we're going to do a panel discussion. And the panel discussion will have uh, the four people who you can see on your screen at the moment, the four experts. So that's Natalie, who's giving the talk today. Uh, here indeed, Dika Diaz from, from Aston University and um, Pankash Gupta from um, Leicester. So I'll introduce them a bit more at, when we get to the panel discussion at the end. But I want to get on with, with the presentation today, so I'll, I'll introduce our speaker. So um, our main speaker is, is Dr. Natalie Homer. Um, you'll have seen from the invitation that she's a senior research fellow in the Mass Spectrometry Core Facility, and I think that's in the Centre for Cardiovascular Sciences at the Queen's Medical Research Institute, and she's also associated with Edinburgh University. Um, she completed her PhD at Strathclyde University, and then moved into clinical mass spectrometry. I think she's been in uh, with her current position since, or current lab since 2006. So she's clearly very much enjoying clinical mass spectrometry as a, as a career. And um, she's going to, to lead us today through, through the work they've been doing in steroid profiling, both in a clinical and a preclinical setting. So over to you, Natalie. Thanks ever, much, ever so much, Andy. It's been it's a really great opportunity to uh, present today, so I hope it's of interest. I hope now that I'm going to be able to share the screen and it's going to work. So if you could just let me know if you can see the, my That's front title page. Perfect. Okay. Um, super. So there's my title, Stereo Profiling um, by LCMS in Clinical and Preclinical Studies. Um, uh, and as Andy said, I, I work at um, the University of Edinburgh and I come under the umbrella of the Edinburgh Clinical Research Facility, which is um, a joint venture between the NHS and the University of Edinburgh. Um, on my title slide also, I've got an icon there for the Edinburgh Association of Mass Spectrometrists um, and uh, poorly named Teams now, of course, Teams has taken over as being a well-known something, but um, that is really a group of uh, labs across Edinburgh University which do quite a diverse range of mass spectrometry and, and I can see um, similarities with, with what you have set up um, <clears throat> with, your, with your group. So I'm hoping that I can move on to the next slide without problem. Okay, so um, as an introduction, uh, steroid profiling and steroid analysis, um, why do we need to do it and why do we do it by mass spectrometry? So it's important in a clinical setting, both in a medical and a veterinary setting, and of course in preclinical studies, because um, we can determine endocrine function in health and disease. Uh, and in particular, the preclinical studies, I'm thinking of mice and rats uh, for those models. Um, amino assays commonly used, but they do lack specificity. And of course, LCMS and S methods can be sensitive and specific, but in addition, you can exploit the fact that you can measure multiple compounds simultaneously. And that's really what we've started to do in our lab. Um, so pointing out some of the obvious things, the success of an LCMS MS assay is really down to good sample preparation, excellent chromatographic separation, but also the sensitive mass spectral analysis. And all those three things combined will lead to a working method that you'll be able to apply to, to different studies. So if I think back to how we set up a targeted method, um, I, I'll highlight again that sample extraction is really important and we have to consider all the different stages such as the injection into the chromatographic system, separation, ionization, and detection. And we've been through various situations in the time that I've been within the lab I'm in of trying things like APCI, considering APPI, 
Um, but the method that I'm talking about today has actually been developed using electrospate ionization, in part because we're a user, um, a high user lab, which required change of instrumentation, sometimes overnight, from one ionization source to the other, and it wasn't successful. We weren't able to um, to, to get that working and found that ESI was just more reliable in that context. Um, but we don't think we're compromising our sensitivity by doing that either. So how do we set up a targeted mass spec method? Um, we've got a range of mass spectrometers in our lab. So uh, in the first instance, we identify the most suitable. And as I said, we would identify an ionization um, mode that we would want to choose. We are acutely aware of the need to separate our isomers chromatographically. Um, and another important section uh, of a targeted method is to exclude um, matrix effects. So optimize our extraction as much as possible. So I have a couple of things on this slide, which are in red. So I'm asking here the question, which compounds? Of course, I need to know what sample type. Is it plasma, urine, serum, whole blood, something like that? And how much of it do you have? Is it two mils or, or 100 microliters or less? But a key part to, to one of the reasons why we've pushed the direction of, of the method that I'm talking about is how many samples. If you've got 10, then I'm fine for us to do liquid liquid extraction. But if you've got hundreds or thousands, then it's not going to be practical. So before I go into the specifics of the method, when we're handling samples for a clinical trial, we have to handle them in the best way we can. Um, and we have to have a method that is absolutely spot on. So we follow um, the European Medicines Agency um, quantitative method validation guideline or bioanalytical method validation. Um, and so there's various rules that we follow to make sure that we're um, reaching um, limits of detection that, that are sensible. We have to have precision and accuracy or assess our bias at least um, and linearity um, uh, greater than 0.99. And also we need to define our low and high ranges. And that's really important. And if you only have a small amount of sample, it's particularly important. And there's, there's a little diagram there to demonstrate the differences between precision and accuracy. For us, within the clinical research facility, um, our local uh, research and development uh, office uh, is a cord, and they approve all clinical studies that happen in Edinburgh. And we're considered in recent times, and this hasn't happened when I first started, but in recent times, they've uh, required us to be considered um, an approved vendor. So we have to go through good clinical practice training in our lab to make sure that our work is um, acceptable to a cord. And there's always the suggestion that we may have our labs inspected. So um, that is the level that we work at, good clinical practice. So steroid analysis by mass spectrometry. Um, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism um, requested in 2013 that all sex steroid analysis was conducted using some form of mass spectrometry. And that was a, obviously a good thing for us in, in the lab that has mass spectrometry, but it threw in a challenge for a lot of researchers because that wasn't a technology that they had access to and they really needed to talk to us about the work that they needed to get done. And the first group of people who came to us were people who were looking at um, murine samples or mouse samples. Um, and of course, uh, the reason that, the, that mass spectrometry was considered the most important is because um, chromatography provides separation prior to detection and the tandem mass spectrometry improves the specificity and that's above and beyond the immunoassay. So if we take a look at the stereogenic pathway, it can be quite complex when you first look at it. Um, and we have quite a lot of isobaric compounds within that, um, within that uh, pathway. So um, if I look at this 21 deoxycortisol and the 11 deoxycortisol, they're the same mass and they also are the same mass as corticosterone over here. So we know that we have to separate out those steroids. Interestingly, if I consider back to um, earlier days where I used to set up methods for single steroids, we may look for cortisol and cortisone, or we may look for corticosterone and 11 dehydrocorticosterone. We weren't considering the other isomers there necessarily and our separation may have been shorter. So this adds in a complication, trying to separate out those isobars, but also trying to separate all those isotopomers that you get, because the pathway is really about um, a change of uh, two hydrogens um, in many places. So estrone and estradiol just differ by a mass of two, as does androstenedione dione and testosterone and so forth. So we have to make sure that we're separating those by time, because on a, on a, on a tandem triple quad mass spec, then we aren't uh, going to be able to distinguish um, in any other way other through chromat chromatographic separation. 
So in the first instance, we set up a, uh, a, what still looks quite complex, but focused on androgens and glucocorticoids. And we were using formic acid as our mobile phase modifier. And that was great and fine for those things that take a positive charge. Now, steroids tend to take, are rel relatively neutral, but there are more that would take a positive charge. Um, we were running at quite a high flow rate, 0.5 mils a minute, and our runtime was 14 minutes by the end of that. We're at that point, we're using our Cyx Q trap 6500 plus and operating in multiple reaction mode. Um, so, so, because this steroid method is optimized for positive ion analysis, and we're keen to work in 96 well format plates. And so we can't do a lot of derivatization processes that we've developed. So we had um, done a lot of work with Nina Denver, who is now at Strathclyde uh, University developing a method for estrogen derivatization, but we didn't want to introduce that into what we were considering a steroid profiling method. So taking estradiol specifically, it's got a peak on the hydroxyl on the aromatic ring of 10.3. And although we can add ammonium hydroxide to the mobile phase and look for estrogens only um, to promote negative ion formation, we didn't want to do that. Um, high pH mobile phase impacts positive ion formation and it leads to um, LC column choice reduction and also a short life, especially if you're working at higher temperature. However, there was talk in the literature um, of using ammonium fluoride for steroid analysis. And so that's what we, we did. We, um, assessed different concentrations of ammonium fluoride and managed to um, incorporate that into our methodology. So, um, so here we have a similar run. We've got 60 minute run, 0.5 mils per minute, um, and we've added the estrogens in um, and we're working in both positive and negative and we're successfully detecting estradiol and est estrone there. And aldosterone, which does actually also take a positive charge, actually is much better and in the negative iron, much cleaner. Uh, so we're really happy with that. Um, and we got excellent sensitivity and also an increase in response for the positively charged ions. So it was a real win for, for our intent of producing a steroid profiling method. So I mentioned there um, that we wanted to, to, do, to develop a method for 96 well format. And so much of our work had historically been done by liquid liquid extraction, which is really manual extraction. Um, uh, in our lab um, and really prone to preparation errors and variability between analysts. So various students would come and do something and then we'd come back with different results But when we compare studies and it was really causing us a lot of trouble. So we investigated supported liquid extraction, first of all in cartridges and then eventually moved across completely to the plates. Um, and in this format, if you've not come across it before, you dilute your sample and you elute it and the variable is the diluent and the eluent. And so we went through a whole series of experimentation to work out what was best for the whole panel of steroids. So you can imagine that was quite, quite a lot of work um, to, to assess every steroid. And often we would choose estrogens as our marker. If it was good for estrogens, then it was going to be good for the rest because the concentration of estrogens are so low. Um, we found that 0.1% formic acid as a diluent and a mixture of dichloromethane and isopropanol as an eluent gave the best recovery across the steroid pa uh, panel. And in this setup, we developed it for extracting 200 microliters of human plasma. And we use what's called an SLE 400, so that takes a volume of 400 microliters. Um, it is available singly, but we have definitely transferred across the 96 well format because single extractions have, have shown more variability. The next step um, was some success in, in getting funding for this, um, this piece of equipment, which is uh, a liquid handling robot. Um, it's, it's, if you've never had one in the lab before, then it's a complete uh, dream really. And it was, uh, it was just like getting a new person in the lab who can do the work. Um, this possibly isn't going to play, it really doesn't matter. You don't need to see a robot working. Um, but uh, it does so much of the pipetting uh, and takes away so much of the error that you get when someone po pops into the lab and interrupts you and has a chat. So um, it takes about 90 minutes for a, for a 96 well plate to extract in that uh, format. Um, and Trisha, who is our excellent technician in the lab, she can get through two plates a day, no problem. The mass spec can't. This is a visual actually of what the method uh, really looks like after having worked out how that supported liquid extraction would work. We prepare a calibrant, um, a standard curve of course, and then we have a number of unknowns. We have double blanks on there to make sure that we've not got carryover or an issue with the plates. Um, centrifuge our samples, transfer them across to the plate, 
the diluent and the eluent are added on the robots. We dry down under a 96 volt evaporator um, and resuspend in uh, water methanol before um, applying it to the mass spec. So this takes um, not quite a full day. Uh, it, as I said, you can get two plates done, but we've got a dual 96 volt dry down system, which helps us to, um, to get through more than one plate at once. So once we had a working method, we wanted to make sure we were doing absolutely the best we could. Um, and so, so within that, we incorporated as many isotopically labelled internal standards as we could. We had been quite used to using um, analogues for our internal standards because we were only looking for one or two steroids in the past. So epimers, but we wanted to use the labelled internal standards. And in fact, as a couple of years have gone by, we've actually found more um, sensible internal standards than we, than we ever could before. We also wanted to make sure calibration ranges were physiologically relevant uh, and to use these certified reference materials where possible. So the cerulean section of Sigma has been really, um, has been our shopping list actually. So we, we prepare quality controls in our lab, um, but we've also relatively recently um, engaged with uh, the Chrome Systems calibrators or these commercial calibrators, which help us to assess whether our levels are coming out correctly. And also we've signed up to the National External Quality Assessment Scheme uh, for six steroids in the pathway that we've developed uh, the, the work in. Um, and as I said, we're a good clinical practice and accord vendor approved. So this is just a snapshot. Our standard, our calibrants are, are arranged across, um, it differs across uh, the, the different kind of um, steroids. So glucocorticoids are in the high nanomolar, um, androgens in the nano, in the kind of nanomolar and then a picomolar for the estrogens and aldosterone and, and those intermediates. So that's our range. And just to point out those things that I mentioned earlier when looking at the pathway, we've got a lot of isobars that we have to make sure are separated. Um, so 11 deoxycorticosterone, 17 hydroxyprogesterone. And some of these intermediates are real indicators in certain diseases such as congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So being able to identify whether someone has that, uh, whether they're undiagnosed or not, is really important and useful for us as a lab connected to uh, endocrinology research. Um, as I also mentioned, we've got uh, the isotopologues of uh, um, androstene dione and testosterone that can contribute to each other because they only differ by a mass of two. Um, and this, we've got an epimer there, well, testosterone and DHEA, we've got EPT as well. So you can see we've got lots of things that we have to be really confident of uh, before we um, proceed with the analysis um, and can be confident the results are good. Um, this is another demonstration. This is in negative mode, but to say that we use those internal standards really to track those peaks. So in an analytical standard set, you don't see other peaks, but in biological samples, you can. And certainly if you move into different species. So having confidence that we've got um, the peak uh, coming out underneath where it should is, is absolutely um, really helpful for us in the lab, but also for students to understand that they're identifying the right peak. From a detailed perspective, we have amended the, the method since, and we've changed to a 2.1 millimeter. Um, uh, we've reduced a flow to 0.3 mils, and we've still got the separation that we require. We're really keen to reduce the amount of solvent we were using because we were flying through it before. It suddenly became quite costly. I won't expect you to read this, but the specifics of the mass spectrometry um, are given here. We have a quantifier and a qualifier for all steroids, as you can imagine, and the internal standards are included there too, and the negative ion is set there too. So I'm just flying now straight into results of a clinical study. So this is in progress. The manuscript is about to be submitted. Um, it's a study where um, women were given dexamethasone and um, we were looking to see in the first instance if that had an impact on the, the endogenous glucocorticoids, which we have demonstrated both in the serum, but also in the endometrial tissue. And we've developed a method for handling tissue extracts um, in the same way. This is the pathway that has been uh, followed and all of the steroids that are in bold have been detected in these samples. Um, and then there's many other clinical steroid profiling applications, but, we're, but some of these studies are really big or we're still bringing the data together. So I can't show data today in particular. Um, we've worked, uh, it's, it's almost 12 months now, but the data is, is ready to be submitted, I think, um, for the study for Azaric 4, which is a COVID study um, with Kenny Bailey, looking at 300 different steroid samples um, and looking at the variation in 
uh, steroids, uh, depending on the severity of disease. Um, and that's been presented at um, British Endocrinology Society as a poster, but it's not ready to talk about really. Um, there's a follow up there, which is the FOS COVID um, long COVID study. So we've just completed that. So I'm really excited to see what these really come out as and to see if there are changes um, and observations that long COVID has um, over, over the COVID, the acute situation when they're in hospital. Um, we have published on cortisol analysis and saliva using this method, but focused on cortisol. But what it means for us in the lab is that we can use the same method and just focus on cortisol and glucocorticoids that are important. Uh, it means that we don't have multiple different methods that we have to keep changing things around for. So that's helped us streamline what we do in the lab. So that's been important. We've done another study looking at saliva um, just earlier this year in neonates. You can see that we've got quite a challenge arising when we start to embark upon larger study size samples. And in fact, this was the first study of 300, which was huge. And my head was spinning with the data. But now we've, we're working towards much larger studies and we've got processes in place. But if you think about what we're trying to do, if somebody wants us to profile 12 steroids and 100 samples, it results in 1200 concentrations. And we're using the software that you use on targeted analysis mass specs, and we have to check the calibration curve, check the internal standard, check the peak has been picked correctly. So it is very labor intensive. Um, and we've got lots of students involved in these projects because it is such a lot to get right. We don't want to report the wrong concentrations. Um, uh, and, and we're also looking at steroid profiling in a saliva study. It's called EPAD, and it's actually looking at um, midlife uh, cortisol um, levels, um, but looking at the stereo profile um, in, in a study of dementia. So moving on then to how, how do we apply this methodology to preclinical stereo profiling, because we used to do targeted steroid analysis, as in just looking for glucocorticoids. Um, so we have to be mindful that a different sample type will need to be checked thoroughly before it can be used. So we can't just say, oh, we've got a method, we'll just be able to do it. So we've been doing things like pigs and horses, we had to check that there's no terrible matrix effects before we proceed and do profiling there. But in particular with murine and rodents, or murine in particular, we have limited sample volume. So can we work with lower volumes is the big question. Um, and of course, the stereo pathway may be different, which is the case for, for rodents. So keen to keep that biotage robot in that kind of workflow that I described, and we're keen to keep using the isotopic labeled internal standards, but we need to develop a species specific SOP before committing to the analysis. And a further point is that we can include steroid block compounds in the method if that's what's required. So we are quite flexible. So this is an example of um, work that has been done in murine samples, but it's been done in 100 microliter, so it's a cull volume. Um, we also looked in the adipose tissue, so we're looking just for three steroids, corticosterone, aldosterone and 20-beta dihydrocorticosterone. And that was published um, earlier this year. So that's, that's good that we're able to look at three different steroids. Um, but we do definitely want to look at uh, smaller volumes. So I, I, this is a repeat of that previous slide, but I'm highlighting that you can get something called SLE 200, which takes 100 microliters of sample. But we've actually um, demonstrated that diluting that sample uh, if it comes as 20 microliters or 50 microliters actually still results in, in a concentration that's sensible. Um, and we elute with a lower volume because of course we've loaded less. So chromatographic steroid profiling for avian and rodent species actually lacks the cortisol pathway. Um, the rodents and the avians don't, don't have cortisol as their active glucocorticoid, they have um, corticosterone, uh, which is shown here. So that makes it a little simpler for us. It doesn't have so much of a, of a stress on separation of all of those intermediates that you see in a human steroid profile. Um, and what do we use it for now? We use it to assess stress. So we can assess the glucocorticoid profile. That's the active and inactive version. We can look at 11 beta hst one um, enzymes there. Um, we can look at sexual dimorphism, though there's still a challenge because our estrogen detection is not as good as I'd like it to be. But looking at the androgen estrogen balance is something that people continue to ask us uh, to develop methods for. And we're in cardiovascular sciences la uh, um, floor, and so assessing aldosterone levels is important, particularly in those who are studying kidneys. Um, but 
Critically, in preclinical work, reference range is uh, well documented in human sterile biology, but it's not the case for rodents. And in the literature, if you search through the literature, you find that so many have used ELISAs. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, these aren't a reliable approach. Um, so we started to embark upon establishing a kind of reference range in what is commonly given to us, which is a C57 black six. Um, mice. Um, and so here we've we've done a box plot of the resulting concentrations. Now it's hard to um, to know how variable this should be in amongst what should be wild type happy six mice. Um, they're three months old, but it's starting to give us a picture of that the profile is quite comparable to humans, but there are differences. I'm not showing those differences here today. This is done in a hundred microliter extraction. Um, but can we reduce that volume of sample needed to still detect a profile of steroids or do we lose that data? Actually, no, we managed to do it in 20 microliters. We've been quite successful there and you can see quite a variation there in the androstene dion level, for example. Um, but uh, I was quite pleased that we we're able to detect, uh, um, but detect in just 20 microliters, which really opens doors to um, ultimately maybe being able to do tail nicks and looking at dynamic steroid profiling in mice, which you can do in a human, but of course you've not been able to do it in mice before. So we've applied this to a number of different things. Um, we've applied this methodology um, to looking at steroid panel in quail studies. Again, they were just looking at three different steroids in the end, but we did profile um, at the time, but these were the most important to them. So corticosterone, androstene dino and testosterone, and that was published this year as well in scientific reports. So it's, it's always great to see methods published in uh, in a in a paper um, and, the, and the results has been used this is an interesting one this is in in draft um, but close uh, steroid profiling to verify what's called cell autonomous sex identity in birds so we have this method and and people I talked about this at the Rosen Institute and um, Mike Clinton asked if it was possible to to, to apply this to, to chicken plasma and so this is what we did and interestingly birds, um, in terms of their chromosomes, the ZW is female and the ZZ is male. Um, and it's known that sex steroids have little or no effect on the development of the secondary sexual characteristics of birds, such as the comb you get on, on the male birds. Um, uh, and sexual dimorphism is determined actually by the sex chromosome content of cells in individual tissues. So it's known, but it's never really been demonstrated. So we wanted to explore that relationship between what's called Cassie and hormones in these sex reversal models. Um, and the, one of the approaches is using fadrazole, which is an inhibitor of aromatase. So the aim for us was to profile steroids at different stages of development in this sex reversal model in chickens. And what was available was 200 microliters of plasma and tissue lysate. Uh, tissue steroid profiling is demonstrated here. So we have a nice bead rupter and centrifugation and, and uh, uh, a filtering approach using. Um, phospholipid depletion plate for our tissue homogenous. So here we were able to um, profile steroids, so to speak. We looked at progesterone, estrone, estradiol, androstene dyne and testosterone. So that's quite a wide range of different steroids in a single sample. And if they were to do that using um, an ELISA, they would only really have managed one or perhaps two for the volumes required. And of course, it's not optimized for that kind of sample type. And these samples were collected at day seven, nine and 11. And you can see that the gonads are steroidogenically active. And then in the same, uh, in the same experimentation, um, the chickens, those that then were, were born or hatched, uh, we looked at the, the plasma steroid profile. Um, 308 eggs, or sorry, it's fertile Ross 308 eggs were injected with either this um, a vehicle or this aromatase inhibitor, Fadrazole, at 72 hours of incubation. And then plasma was collected at 10 weeks and at 26 weeks. And so you can see a difference there. Um, because at 10 weeks, the sex steroids are low or undetectable, um, while the adrenal steroids are at similar, le similar levels. And then at 26 weeks, the sex steroids differ significantly between the male and female birds. Um, and so this steroid profile of the fadrazole treated females matches that of males. And that demonstrates that the, 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 that the model um, works. Um, so this is, this is a summary, really. The LCMSMS method allows for steroid profiling in rodents and avians for up to 12 steroids. Um, and we can do it in 200 microliters uh, in chicken plasma, but we've managed to demonstrate less than 100 
in mouse plasma for 10 or 12 steroids, depending on the question. And we've also managed to introduce tissue homogenization analysis, which has actually been quite a step forward. But there's still things to do. As I said, we want to really define a reference range in wild type mice um, for each of these steroids. Um, we still want to be able to reduce that volume. I, I say 20 microliters and, and, and the researchers who have mice say, can we do 10 or less? So there's always a pr pressure to reduce that volume of sample that's required. Um, uh, my question here is, are we comfortable detecting all steroids in a single sample? I'm not convinced by all the estrogen analysis that we do, that we're getting all the estrogens. Um, so I want to do more experimentation there. Um, and so perhaps we might need to derivatize to ensure estrogen detection. Um, and recently, um, we've worked in the lab and developed some 96 well plate uh, est uh, estrogen derivatization work. So maybe we can we can marry that together. Um, and yeah, I've met, I mentioned that question there. Does the range detected match with that of humans? And so can we take the method on UPLC as we do it at the moment and transfer it to microflow LC? We have one in the lab and we've, we've developed part of a method for that. Scott Denham has spent time doing that um, and Yanis is working on it now. So if we could work at microflow, could we reduce the sample amount in that way instead? Um, and of course, the final question is, can we use the method to, to look at steroids in smaller amounts of tissue because the amount of tissue in that previous set was, was, um, was defined already. And I just wanted to summarize really what we can do within the lab and what we have, um, just to see uh, how it cha changes uh, with, with what you have available in your different facilities. So we really aim at being able to develop methods for targeted analysis. And quite a lot of our work is um, looking at stable isotope traces, the biomarkers, uh, as I call them there, so such as the steroids or um, uh, tryptophan metabolites, but also drugs um, such as paracetamol and other those steroids that uh, interfere with the steroid pathway. Uh, sorry, the drugs that interfere with the steroid pathway. And we do look at various different types of samples, so clinical, veterinary, preclinical, and we can do both a service of sample analysis, um, but we can also do training um, of students so that they can be, be part of that story and develop their own methods. Um, and we wouldn't, be the, we wouldn't be who we are without the team that we've got. Um, and uh, you can see a picture here of, of those in the lab who work um, within the lab. And I've got another picture at the next slide. Um, which uh, details who everybody is. We've got an imaging mass spectrometer, um, Synapt, um, which, which is an interesting piece of kit that Shazia Khan works on full time, um, which uh, they've started to do some great imaging with that. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've got teams to bring us all together uh, in Edinburgh. And so if you're not doing targeted mass spec, then I would push you in the direction of other, other mass spec facilities in Edinburgh. Um, who have um, a range of different pieces of equipment and skills and expertise in other areas. And here is the final picture. Just to point out, Tricia is, the, is our technician who just flies through all of those samples and can do plates and plates. Um, and uh, Scott Denham is uh, our bioanalytical um, uh, expert uh, and Shazia Khan is there. Um, Emma Hurst works on the vitamin D profile and Yanis is working as was just at the moment, and Joe Simpson as a mass spec analyst who's developed many drug targeted drug analyses um, using the, um, the EMA guidelines really to develop these very serious sounding methods. Um, and so that's, that's the final slide. So I hope they haven't taken too much time up there. Oh, it's just flown by. I think it's timed itself out. Um, I think I will stop sharing now. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. Thank you ever so much, Natalie. That was okay. that was a, a beautiful talk, taking us through from from your method development right the way through to actually then taking it back into into the preclinical areas and, and the challenges with that. So it's be, it's really set the scene um, nicely for, for in steroid analysis, but also for for a, a discussion. I think about about how how easy it is to do these and what the key things are and what people need to think about. So I'm. Um, just going to introduce um, the other two members of the panel. Um, so we're going to do this as a panel um, discussion. So obviously Natalie will answer any questions that are specific to, to her work, but we'll, I'll also be asking our two panelists for, for their comments on, on the methodology and, and on development. And, and I, I have some questions that I might lead them, but if you have any questions for them, then that would be great. So our two panelists today are, are um, Dr. Pankash Gupta. Um, he's a consultant in the Department of Metabolic Medicine 
and clinical pathology at the University Hospitals of, of Leicester NHS Trust. Um, so he comes from a very much a clinical background um, in, in the pathology area. So we're very, very grateful to him for giving up his time today and, um, and joining our panel. And then our second panelist is Dr. Indu, Irinduka Diaz from um, Aston Medical School at, the, at Aston University. And she specializes in, in cholesterol analysis there and, and other areas of aspect. So those are our, our other two panelists along with, with Natalie. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to take, there's a couple of questions have, have um, come in on the um, Q&A. Um, so I'm going to take those. If you have any questions, please put them up in the Q&A. If you'd like to actually talk, then if you ask in the chat, I'll, um, Alex may be able to promote you to, um, uh, to be able to, to actually ask the question in person if you would like to do that. Um, so the, one of the questions that um, uh, has come from Professor Don Jones is, um, can you provide an indication of how long it took to, to develop the method for human steroid analysis and then to validate it? And I think what we might go on and talk about is, is, is how that um, is, is in general for, for clinical. But Natalie, if you'd like to answer that question first. OK, thanks. Yeah, that's a very relevant question. Um, how long did it take to develop? I think we were building on what we had been doing for many years. Um, but uh, to, to sit down and develop a method... We had a student working with us and she was with us for four months. So we developed a method over four months. But subsequent validation, once we'd introduced the, um, the robot uh, and altered the calibration range, I would say that took us another, another, another three or four months to get that validated um, for, uh, yeah, for the extraction and, the, and be, to be confident that our calibrant ranges were correct. Thank you for that. So, so that's an eight eight month process. So I, I have a sort of general question for the for the panel then about that, which is 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 that reasonable? I mean, is it to, to take that long to develop an assay, or or are you often being pressed to develop assays much more quickly than that? And what are the challenges then in developing assays faster than than say eight to ten months, which is is quite a long time if there's a, a sudden need. Yeah. So from uh, my experience, again, I, I agree with the, that amount of period for, that Natalie mentioned about months. Um, I think especially in, again, from my experience, so um, in academia, we normally um, might be share the facility with others. And also it is how much uh, workforce we have uh, to spend on. And those kind of things can also affect the development of assay. But if, if it is much more focused, and you have the ability to access the, um, the instruments and uh, you have the workforce, students and also funding, then it, it is possible to um, get these things a bit more faster. But um, I think still it will, we need to go through all the standardization and make sure the calibration and everything is in place. So three to four months, I think still will take that, that long time. I think I should have a comment on, on how quickly the, the, you need to develop assays and how long it takes and, and perhaps what it is, what the challenges are in, in, in terms of developing an assay quickly, whether it's it's money, or people, or whether it really just is, is time. Uh, thanks, uh, Andrew, for the invite. And uh, uh, thank you, Natalie, for an excellent talk. Uh, the clinical perspective is very different, different in the sense, what is the driver to set the assay up? Now, we have centers such as Brian Keevil and in London who are experts on steroid profile. Mm -hmm. And these are low volume tests. So in a clinic, do all centers, in a lab, do all centers need to set this up is the first question. Uh, I think eight month period that you uh, suggested is reasonable. The difficulty is interpretation of these assays, which comes over time. So once you've set the assay up to interpret it in the clinical context, you require experience. Mm -hmm. A similar uh, aspect is when you do uh, screening for inborn errors of metabolism, which are generally done by LCMS, that requires years and years of experience. So setting up a method is one aspect, which takes a few months provided you have the resources, but then the interpretation is quite complicated. And more and more is becoming uh, evident that few centers clinically specialize in few areas, rather than you doing everything. So for us personally, we are not into a whole steroid profile, but we do want to measure things like urinary cortisol, centrine, mm -hmm. hydroxyprogesterone, which are more straightforward to interpret and set up. 
So I hope that answers the question. Really. I think that's a really interesting point about the experience uh, of handling the samples. So I talked about how we started on samples for the COVID study and it was over 12 months ago. It's only now I feel really confident talking about this method because we've had that experience of biological samples. So we buy in serum from Sigma and assess it and things like that, but it's not the same as human samples coming in. So you start to understand how robust the method is only when you've got the real samples, by which point you're using those really precious samples. So it's actually quite um, a, a stressful moment when you do embark upon that. But yeah, I understand having expertise in certain areas um, is, is valuable um, and you don't need to reinvent the wheel necessarily. Um, the steroid profiling method came about for us uh, simply because people were asking us to do little bits of the steroid pathway all the time and we really needed a method that was robust. So in some ways we were looking for a method that would do a lot for mouse and human. So that's where it's come about for us. Um, and, and its application to humans has taken longer than the application to the murines. Yeah, weirdly. Can I ask a, a follow-up question to that, which is not to Natalie and, and the panel. So, so Natalie, uh, you, you obviously developed this assay within your laboratory. Did you at the stage where you were doing that, set it up for your lab or did you think about a broader context, whether this could then be transferred to other labs if they needed you know, across the NHS, if they needed to do the same sort of profiling? And, uh, and if the other, other panelists would, would comment on, on whether they think this is important or whether you just develop assays locally. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's an interesting point. So I, it was the years of experience of somebody asking me to analyze glucocorticoids and then saying, can you take that extract and look at androgens in it? That, <laughs> that pushed me in that direction. Um, so, um, so I knew that people would always be asking me for more than they'd originally asked me. So in some ways it's about funny design at the beginning of the beginning of their study. Um, I did have a sense that there was more need in the veterinary context. We've got more connection with Roslyn now so we could see that there was maybe applicability to to other species um but but its application and, and transfer to other labs uh, NHS labs I'm not sure because I, I see that many NHS labs take a small panel of steroids I think um just as Dr Gupta was saying there you you have you look for urinary free cortisol because that's going to diagnose something no one needs to diagnose a panel just um uh, the profile i don't think they don't need to see the full profile yeah so if i can ask our other panelists whether whether at the time when these, these you're developing these assays you think about that broader context or whether it is you focused on doing it locally I think for me, so it's main drive is it's the local local interest, but it is it is really important point that um, at some point this is going to be applied in in a clinical setting. I think one of the challenge again could be again the different types of in instrumentation and that can also affect the 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 way we see these uh, different metabolites. So cross laboratory kind of standardization thing should should happen if we actually thinking about transferring this into a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I, I again go back to our experience locally in Leicester. Uh, we work very closely with uh, Don, and I have I have one foot in research. So so we are uh, always very keen to get translational work into the lab. Uh, and I think it, that requires one close collaboration between university and NHS staff rather than working in separate silos. The second is, as uh, Dr. Das suggested, having similar instrumentation. And the third is having a com common vision as to where you plan your research and NHS to go. Uh, so. So I think it's, it's, it's very useful uh, and we are not very good in the NHS or academia to learn from each other. Uh, and I think this uh, collaborations need to be strengthened really so that you know, the excellent work that academia does can be uh, absorbed by NHS. One example is the coronavirus work, which you know was really uh, very quickly translated into real life. Thank you. So I'll, I'll move the discussion on. There's, a, there's another question that's from, from Professor Corinne Spickett at Aston University. It says, says really nice work, Natalie. Um, 
she missed if you said this, but how easy was it to vary your protocols between, say, plasma and serum or saliva? So which is, is there a preferred biofluid? To, 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 and this is a general question. You, you tend to see things done in, done in, in serum or plasma. Um, obviously, it's, you know, saliva is an alternative or urine. Is it really necessary to use plasma or serum? Does it make a map? Does it matter which of those we use? And, and should we be developing assays which are perhaps easier to sample like urine or, or saliva? So Natalie first. No, that, that's a good point. Uh, we, we find actually that serum has a, has a slightly higher um, uh, concentration of steroids. Uh, we did this a study in, in horses and found that serum resulted in a higher glucocorticoid level than plasma. But we don't get much opportunity to do a comparison between plasma and serum in human samples. We either get one or the other. So we just have to make sure that our matrix effects are not um, obscure uh, in between the plasma and serum. The saliva in particular, we um, needed to alter the calibration range uh, for salivary analysis for steroids because the love me to HSD2 sits in the salivary gland. So you end up finding a lot of inactive uh, glucocorticoid uh, instead of the um, active glucocorticoid. So, so it's about looking at the concentration as well. With the saliva, we find that um, uh, the diluent is the same uh, and the aluent didn't, didn't need to change either, but it's just something we had to check. Yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Do our other panellists have any comments on, on preferred biofluids? Yes, I think it, for, for me, um, uh, I tried different things, uh, again, different biofluids. Um, I found plasma is um, easier and because it's quite rich in the analytes that I want to um, um, measure in terms of cholesterol and modified or hydroxylated cholesterol. And um, I think it is to do with the sample preparation stage. So you, you will have to, like Natalie said, have to change uh, the way you dilute or before you uh, or the way you precipitate proteins that, that if you um, optimize that stage and the, the post analysis will be similar. So I'd just like to add, uh, for us, it depends on the clinical context. For example, salivary cortisol is becoming more popular. And in some instances, in infants, or uh, if you're using tests like overnight dexamethasone test, or you need a particular time measure, salivary cortisol may be a good measure. The, the other example is of dried blood spots. Now, there is a move towards uh, having remote testing of patient samples, especially because of the COVID, there's a try that patients don't need to come to hospitals to collect blood. So the dried blood spots has been uh, there for TDMs, but probably there's an increased role for remote testing. So I think the sample matrix depends, the sample kind depends on what is the clinical need really. Between plasma and serum, I don't think there's too much difference for us really. So I, I'll follow on from that. So, so Professor Don Jones again asked, asked the question, do you utilize QCs in the analysis? And I just brought that out to how easy it is to normalize data across those different biofluids, whether it's much more challenging to use urine or, or, or um, uh, saliva than it is to use plasma or serum in terms of trying to normalize the signal. So um, we started to use um, gold serum for our QCs. I was really pleased to find gold serum in abundance. Uh, and then we only recently got our second order, which took 10 months to arrive. <laughs> so <laughs> we're a bit disappointed by, by that. I mean, obviously it's very hard to get a matrix that doesn't have serum in it. Uh, and we didn't really want to do in-house charcoal stripping. So um, yeah, we do use QCs. If we have to, we'll just use QCs that have been prepared in water. And actually we find that it comes out reliably so. Uh, and then, as I said, I, I, we've started to buy these calibrators from Chrome Systems, which have just given us that bit more confidence in the results. Um, so there's kind of an external QC. Um, but you do need to have something uh, to be confident. We find that the first thing that people are going to question is the absolute concentration, because it feels like it's been written in stone to the investigator. But um, we, we need to be confident that what we're sending out is correct. Yeah, so QC is really, really important. I think to um, add to that, uh, between different types of biofluids, I normally use pool samples as, as a QC uh, in terms of analyzing that specific type of uh, samples. Um, yeah. Uh, 
I, I really don't have anything much to add. But whenever there's a laboratory-based method, I think round robin setting sending of samples for EQ is useful. And for IQC, I think as people have suggested, pool samples uh, are an option. So if I can follow on from that then um, to, to Natalie, but also to the others. So when, when you started working with this broader panel of, of steroids, and, and I'm, I'm sure it's true in many other areas as you start to develop new assays, was the, the lack of, of isotopically labeled standards a challenge at the start of that? Yeah, a huge one. <laughs> Just having that confidence, uh, as I was saying, of, of uh, being able to pick out the peak because it comes out at the same time. We were using for uh, corticosterone in the murine samples, um, D8 corticosterone, which has been what's ever used. Um, in fact, we use that in a human clinical study. Um, for as a tracer and then recently carbon 13 corticosterone came out huge difference because deuterium the eight deuteriums make it come off earlier so the lack of confidence in the peak picking was really quite pronounced so um it it's been stark actually the change in the last two or three years how how many more steroids have become available um and, and also as as these certified reference materials coming as a concentration um uh, for both the, the analyzed but also the labeled version. Yeah, it's made a big difference. It, it's actually striking if you if you look at your calibration curve and you try you try a different internal standard or and the standard the internal standard it should be, it just matches so much better. So it makes a huge difference. Yeah. It's worth the investment. Yeah, just just, just to add to that. Um, and also the uh, the stability of this deteriorated standard sometimes can go off all the mm. time. So that also a huge challenge that you start to see the uh, uh, the parent peak that comes up. So uh, storage is really important, aliquoting and that, that sort of um, uh, being careful with the internal standards. Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's a, another question from Professor Corinne Spickett. She says, you mentioned that you have thousands of concentrations to analyze in some of the studies that you have lots of PhD students helping with the analysis. Uh, it, it's good training for the students, but of course, the more people you have doing it, the, the more that you're likely to introduce subjectivity or, or challenge changes in, in um, the way that samples are processed. So how, how, do you, have you considered any sort of informatics approaches to, to look for these sorts of variations and, and the question I, I have for the panel in general is do, do we have do we need to do this do we need to continually look at the data that we're getting and analyze over large numbers of samples to look for variations um, and especially if those clinical samples are coming from a range of different hospitals for instance um it, that's a hugely important point and one of the reasons why I put it on there because um, it, it wasn't what I was expecting when I started to go through this method. I just thought, oh, it's great that we're going to have 18 steroids per sample and then you think this is horrendous. <laughs> so, yes, I think we do need to introduce some automated bioinformatics and as much as the, the integration software and what we use as multi-quant has some ha, has abilities to automate it it doesn't do everything right it does need to be ha, ha, to have a look over so i i agree some subjectivity i i tend to be the final qc on all of this data set but it's huge <laughs> i drive myself scatty with it so i am kind of actively seeking uh, approaches that that will simplify that um though I, i'm not not getting very far at the moment but uh yes it is uh it is terrible. That, but yeah, do you think it, it, it isn't robust enough? It's a good question. Uh, the check is the calibration curve. If that's consistent between batches, then that helps. But of course, the old rogue sample requires another check, which I do based on uh, expected concentrations. But again, it's lots of post-analysis work that I'm doing. And that's not really, not an area I've really worked in before. So yeah, new to me, really. And is this a challenge the other panelists find as well? So, uh, so, uh, I, uh, so far as uh, I, I, uh, in NHS, we do not currently use bioinformatics, and I think we are a long way away from that. But the the variability, the operator variability is a big issue. And for that, uh, you know, the regular training and uh, monitoring of operator uh, uh, results is needed. So we do have the standard Levy Jennings charts where you see the standard deviation of an assay and then you see how an operator is performing and uh, whether SOPs are followed and 
whether the EQA results that an operator sends are within the expected range. So that helps us uh, define quality control. And, and we have to do it for our UCAS accreditation, for any asset that's UCAS accredited, that all operators are within a certain, um, you know, IQC. But regards informatics, um, I, I'm afraid I won't be able to answer the question really. Okay, that there is there is a, a question that's come in from from Henry, um, which I think is is, a, is an interesting question. So so uh, he writes, I think a challenge for new assays, i.e., full steroid profiling, is spreading awareness of the new assay's capability to the wider NHS, um, to other trusts, for instance, clinicians, primary care, and, and then bringing that test into routine use in those those areas. So so how how can, how do you go about promoting the assay with the, which it has clinical utility? to to the to the um broader community and does having a sort of bespoke in-house assay with no other labs limit limit its usefulness but also limit its its, its validity that's a really really good point um and uh I, again it all goes down to having confidence in the method um and, and what dr was talking about earlier you, you've got to have run lots of samples before you have a, a sense that this method is working so i feel like i'm at the stage um particularly when these publications come out where i can go out there and say this method can do this um, and my intention is that we will talk to um, uh, the uh, research active clinicians on the site that I'm at the Biocorter in Edinburgh to talk about it um, but you know I would love to be able to talk about it outside of Edinburgh uh, so again it's just going to conferences and talking about the method but I was at the BES and no one really cared <laughs> at least it didn't seem like it was picked up though I was talking about the chicken works maybe that was a bit obscure but um yeah it's a really good point and and actually in the end this is almost a product and it will keep the 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 research area alive if people want to um go go and pick up on this method but otherwise it will just disappear and the equipment will no longer be used and we'd have to reinvent the wheel on a new piece of kit so really keen for this to to uh to pick up a bit more interest so yeah very very interesting point so, so Dr. Dr Gupta would you like to comment on on what we need to do in order to to get broader uptake across the NHS uh, I mean uh, I, I would take it as a general question not specifically for steel mm. profile yeah I, I think uh, as uh, Natalie mentioned it's uh, first of all uh, the quality of the assay or and its reputation by publications and then uh, awareness by conferences, and with then trying to get it into guidelines. Mm -hmm. So we have gone through our process. We have developed this uh, test for adherence. Basically, it's a TDM for measuring medications. And so it came by that process. So we published a few articles and presented, and then awareness grew, and now it's coming into guidelines. And I think it's persistence. As you naturally rightly suggested, you need... Uh, people who are engaged, clinicians who want to adopt the method. Uh, if they see a utility and it's cost effective, uh, you'll get some purchase. Brilliant. So, so we, we have reached the end of our allotted time. Um, I don't know whether um, these three of you are able to stay on the line a bit longer. Um, if you're not, then, then please feel free to leave. What I will do at the end of the, as the session is about to finish is to say thank you to Natalie for her for really interesting and enlightening talk. And obviously generate, that talk has generated quite a lot of thought uh, amongst the, the audience in terms of the, of the way that these assays can, can be taken forward. And to our two panelists who've given their expertise and, and knowledge and helped us through the understanding of, of the ways that we might do this. So thank you to all three of you. We very much appreciate your time today and especially Natalie coming all the way from Scotland over the wires. Um, <laughs> so, so that ends our formal session. So I'd like to also then thank the audience who, who've been here and um, we very much appreciate that um, you were here. Um, this has been recorded and it will be made available to those. Um, so um, I don't know, uh, We'll, we'll stop there in terms of the formal side. I don't know whether the three of you are able to stay on for a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I, I, if there are any questions, I, I just had a couple of other questions, and it, it, there's there's two 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 more. One was one was, um, Natalie, you talked about the fact you've been scaling down your assays in terms of the flow rates you've been using, mm. and you mentioned that you were going through huge amounts of solvents, and this is this sort of issue of of the, the green nature of the, the, yeah. the assays that we do and, and, and whether they are environmentally robust. 
Is there a drive now to try to do something about it? Because obviously, if you're running thousands of these samples, mm. um, then um, I think that, that then, then obviously, you know, that's a lot of solvents and there, there is, an, there is a, an environmental challenge in that. Do you think, is, is that a driver? And do you think it's going to be possible to, to persuade the NHS to, to go down a route of, of, of thinking more, more um, environmentally? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the reason I, I embarked upon that is because uh, sustainability is a group in, in Edinburgh who um, are encouraging of uh, green ideas. And we started to look at what we could improve in our lab. And that was where that came from. And when you look at it, you think, oh, my goodness me. I mean, it doesn't matter to us. We just take this bottle of waste solvent down to the <laughs> down to the stores. But actually, when you think about how much that costs for uplift and if it's contaminated, it has to be discarded in a special way. And then you realize the impact that that's having. So, yeah, we we definitely want to continue to drive down microflow should have been what we were going to work on but covid came along <laughs> so that's really that's really thrown uh, us um uh, a bit of a curveball unfortunately and we've stuck with this 0.3 but that's almost half as much solvent we were, than we were using which is a huge improvement yeah i can the nhs be encouraged i think if the method works then it, it, it should be but um, whether that's, uh, I don't know what their methods specifically are like, but I do see other manufacturers encouraging it. Waters talk about their the green footprint and they should be encouraging that kind of thing. So maybe it's something to encourage the manufacturers to, to consider as well. Do our other panelists want to comment? Uh, I, I, I think uh, for the NHS, uh... All these issues will trickle down, but it will take time. Uh, mm. So if you were to use microflow, it makes it another level of complication. I think yeah. for us, the first step would be if we can use the 96 well plate and have an extractor, you know, a sample mm -hmm. handler, that itself will help. Uh, and if I were to make a case for it, I need 150,000 to get a water handler. It will take a year for me to get that. So you see, that is the real life issue. So unless there's a big drive centrally for us to be green and that shows that it can sh save X amount of money, you know, this won't be taken up in a big way in the NHS because you want something that's robust, simple to do and at the same yeah. time cheap, really. And I guess this comes back to, the, to, to a comment that was made earlier on about what instrumentation is available in different centres. I mean, obviously, Natalie's centre is very, sounds like it's very well set up and has a range of instrumentation and some fairly modern stuff. Whereas many of the NHS labs are still working with, with older equipment and, and rather standard equipment and don't necessarily even have the expertise to, to start to do more complex chromatography. So, so I guess this, this, is, this is a challenge in training as well as, and, and in, in whether, whether that investment in new, new equipment in the NHS labs um, is something that we can persuade the government to do. Mm, it's true. Yeah, it does throw in extra problems if you're going to a lower flow. You can't detect leaks as straightforwardly, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Mm. And, it, it, and I, I, it's, it's incredibly frustrating how difficult it is to change people's perception of, of something they've always done and mm. to move on to something else. Great. I, I think I will probably stop it there if, unless there's anything else that um, anybody wants to raise. No, in which case, thank you, everybody. Natalie, would you mind staying on the line just briefly? Um, I will do, yes. Uh, I think Corin would like to say hi. Thank okay. <laughs> okay, so so again, thank you. Thank you to both of our panellists for, for your time today and, and for your insights and, and I think thought-provoking comments. So thank you for joining in and we really appreciate thank it. Thank you.